Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. This week we'll be looking at the world casting their ballot for a better America. Yesterday on November 9th, the UDES actually appeared before the Universal Periodic Review in Geneva and was actually examined on how they're doing with their human rights record. I kind of think of it as a human rights checkup and the countries of the world, over 120, took the floor to be able to share what they considered about the United States that they were alarmed about. In some ways, it was an international intervention, very concerned about the direction of this democracy and where we should go as we move forward. I'm very fortunate today to have Carrie, Keith, and Krista with me. They're representing different elements of civil society that have been engaged in this process for human rights way before the UPR, and will continue to work beyond that to make sure that human rights are realized in the United States. I'd like to begin with Carrie and ask her a question about what did you think or what are some of your initial observations about the UPR yesterday? Uh, it just happened yesterday. It was sort of painful to see Department of Justice arguments and some of those videos, but what are some of your initial observations that you'd like to share with the world? Okay, so first, uh, my name is Carrie McLean. I am the UPR coordinator for the US Human Rights Network. So to answer your question, Josh, the US presentation was disappointing to put it very mildly. <laughs> there were several misrepresentations made, for example, regarding protection of the First Amendment, regarding immigration, regarding access to justice. I don't wanna to spend too much time on that, but you can view a recording of the UPR on the UN TV website. We also provide a link to the U UPR recording on our website, which is www upr uh, www.upr2020.org over the past year members of our network have organized briefings where they shared information with embassies and diplomatic missions about the situation in the u.s in respect to protection and fulfillment of human rights we were heartened to see several of our recommendations voiced by representatives of governments from all around the world during the upr session yesterday the vast majority of the members of the Human Rights Council talked about police violence and racial discrimination and called for change. Many government reps encouraged the U.S. to re-engage with the Human Rights Council and the Paris Agreement. Some spoke out about migration and one country, Burkina Faso, recommended that the U.S. government address the high rate of paternal mortality amongst Black women. So the high rate of maternal mortality against Black women in the U.S. is an issue that I've worked on in the past. So I was really excited to see at least one country talk about it. Thank you. That's actually a really good point because women's rights were mentioned by a lot. I mean, Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Iceland, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, all talked about women, family planning, and reproductive rights because the U.S. actually said that they are reversing course and had a Geneva Declaration last week trying to outlaw abortion and women's rights. So that's a good point. And Romania talked about paid maternity leave and India equal pay for work. So we're very glad that uh, the countries around the world will raise those points. And maybe Krista, what were some of the priorities that you wanted to be addressed in the UPR of the US? And did any state surprise you with their recommendations? Um. I'm sure, I apologize, I didn't see it, um, but I'm sure nobody surprised me with, <laughs> with anything they have to say. Uh, and it's my understanding that a few uh, countries discussed uh, police violence. And uh, so um, that's what we wanted, basically. Uh, there's an understanding that there's pretty much nothing the UN can do except put pressure on the United States because the United States is so powerful. So uh, we understand the name it and shaming game. Uh, I don't think it would work with this administration, uh, but it may work because he wasn't shamed by anything that he said or did. Um, but I think with the next administration, it's not about naming and shaming. Uh, I, I expect it to be more like um, possibly the Obama men administration, knowing that this is Joe's administration now and he's not VP to Obama. I expect some of the same things to happen, um, that there will be a, a move towards putting uh, police, off, uh, police departments back under consent decrees and there won't be that much of a fight about it. Uh, what I'm hoping is that he listens to the 
the fact that we don't want more police um, and that, you know, there's the deep funding out there, which is kind of musical chairs with money uh, because I believe that they would defund for a little while and then give the money back. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether or not that strategy would work forever. But um, we, we're looking at different programs to, uh, to cover like 50% of the calls to police. Uh, you don't need to come armed to. So uh, we're trying to do the CAHOOTS program. Have you heard of that program out of Oregon? Yeah. So that's what I was looking for, you know, some kind of uh, mentioning of uh, police violence. And as far as women is concerned, because, you know, only 5% of women um, or only 5% of the shootings are women. But you have domestic violence in homes of police officers, which then spills out on the street. In Chicago, there was a statistic um, that 50 uh, police officers who had domestic violence going on in the home had 50% more uh, complaints of excessive force. Uh, there's rape by police officers, which, you know, these guys can be predators and serial rapists. So, and you know, under the, the conventions and under the UN, rape by a government official is torture. So um, it's my understanding under the Obama administration that they started to pick up with their uh, sexual assault cases at the federal level. So we're hoping that they stay up there. So it was just, it was just good news all around to hear that they were addressing police violence, but we know that they were addressing it because of the protest of George Floyd. And funny that Oregon, the, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, in and of itself, you know, just a state up in, you know, would be so uh, ahead of the game when it came to uh, uh, having programs where you didn't use as many police officers. So, yeah, we were happy to hear about that. Okay, and building on that, Keith, I mean, what are some recommendations that we're hoping we can put forward to the new administration that then would mm -hmm. say what we can focus on realizing of human rights in this next UPR cycle? Because it, it'll sort of go at the same time as Biden, it'll be four and a half years. So what are some recommendations you might have well, that we can focus on? Well, uh, let me uh, uh, echo what my colleagues have said, that uh, there are a lot of half-truths and in a few cases, whole lies that were presented in a <laughs> diplomatic uh, manner um, uh, at the uh, UPR. Um, but once you cut through the fog, uh, there were uh, some general recommendations uh, to the US that could in fact help us form our uh, human rights agenda that we could present to the Biden administration. A couple of them are not new. The need for a national institution to focus on human rights. The need for a national uh, plan of action for racial justice. Uh, many people were outraged that the US would re-engage in the uh, uh, expand rather the death penalty, the use of the death penalty at the federal level, and many of the most of the European countries, in fact, called for an immediate moratorium. Um, the uh, uh, ratification agenda of, of CEDAW and the uh, rights of the child and the persons with disabilities, the economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, and this was uh, echoed throughout. I, I was able to watch uh, at least 95 uh, countries uh, and this, this, and of course, uh, George Floyd's name was invoked many times, uh, and as well as the excessive use of, of deadly force by the police. Uh, some of the remedies that were offered included uh, uh, education, human rights education for the police, uh, that, that there be uh, some uh, consistency between any federal policies and state level policies. Uh, unfortunately, there was no mention, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. McLean says it was one country. I heard the elections mentioned, uh, congratulatory notes, and perhaps it was just the timing, but I was still surprised because everyone on uh, who was testifying must have known that the president had just tried to uh, inject himself in the electoral process by calling for an end to the vote counting uh, and to 
provide misinformation to the millions of Americans um, and, and, and to show, in my thinking, an appalling disrespect for people who at risk their lives, their safety and security, uh, braving long lines in order to cast their vote, to participate in the political process that would be consistent with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with the uh, I, the International uh, Convention for Civil and Political Rights, and with uh, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Uh, I could say more about that, but I don't want to dominate the, the, the topic right now, uh, because I think when you look at the thrust of what happened at the UPR, you can say that, um, yes, the US complied by participating, but what is the content of that participation? And if this is uh, what the best that we get out of uh, uh, the, the, this administration, on one level, you can understand it. But on another level, at the subliminal level, they made sure that they had people of color delivering some of the messages. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that um, our movement needs to uh, think through uh, those, those issues. We can't stop who uh, an administration like Trump might put forth but there is recognition of the work that groups like uh, the network have done in the past by in bringing more uh, uh, people of color uh, and the issues that, that African Americans and Latinos, Latinx and, and uh, indigenous peoples and Asian Americans are concerned about. Well, Keith, you brought up so many good points. I mean, the 2.22 AM press conference where of course they were all spread in COVID in the White House we see now saying, you know, frankly, I, I, we did win. And then the November 5th moment, where even off, it was sort of a McCarthy moment where even the networks just finally cut him off when he's yeah. still saying that he's spreading more information and they're fact checking right then saying something they should have done a long time ago. And now with Pompeo's statement today saying, we'll have a smooth transition to our second administration, it's not going. So we did need a, in some ways some stronger recommendations from our allies to say, this isn't normal. Like this, the democracy is being shaken and civil society has done everything they could by going out there and standing in the long lines and, and risking their lives to vote. And now the world needs to also cast that ballot for a better America. And so I think you did bring up a lot of good points. And, and Krista, I know you might want to feed on that as well. But yeah, I mean, we had, it's National Human Rights Institution. We don't have one. The countries that are telling us to Great one is Somalia, Zambia, Qatar, Philippines, Nepal, Lithuania, India. All those countries have national human rights institutions. It's never been done. It also was, in a way, a repudiation of that Commission on Inalienable Rights, saying mm -hmm. that body that was created is trying to create a hierarchy of rights that undermines universal norms. It's definitely putting women's rights underneath. And if there's any comments about the Inalienable Rights Commission we want to make, or to get back to maybe some of the priorities we have to realize human rights in the US, we could look at either of those two. Uh, well, the only comment I'll make about the commission um, is that I think there were a few countries, I heard a few countries actually praising it, which was disturbing. And I, I, I want to believe it's because they're not uh, informed. <laughs> they're not really informed about what it means, but there were a few countries that praised the US for the commission. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, it's, it's interesting that, you know, unalienable rights is part of our constitution, right? I mean, I think the first sentence in the declaration is something about unalienable rights. Um, and you know that we're tied to our constitution. So we're not going to do anything further than uh, quote the constitution, right? Uh, but with that being said, unalienable rights, they're not giving black people unalienable rights, right? Uh, if you have slavery written into your constitution, you're not giving people unalienable rights. You're giving people rights that can be alienated, right? If you can put me in prison and make me a slave, then, you know, you're just talking out the side of your mouth. So, you know, this administration, that's what they've been doing. Uh, I look forward to Biden um, having CERD, having ICCPR, and having um, the CAT uh, uh, conferences so that we can discuss everything we need to discuss over the next year or two. 
Yeah, um, uh, going back uh, uh, to the uh, uh, UPR itself, a, a couple of things, takeaways I think is important. Uh, there was a, a unanimous call for the US to re-engage with the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, this is something that Nikki Haley did, uh, who is likely to be a presidential candidate in 2024 under the uh, uh, direction of State Department and uh, Pompeo, who's also likely to be a candidate and the current president, Donald Trump. Uh, but there was also a call for the U.S. to just have the standard operating procedures to welcome uh, the special measures for all of the special rapporteurs. Um, and and uh, the U.S. Uh, expressed its, uh, as, as uh, Krista has said, its, um, its uh, supremacy of the Constitution uh, theory, uh, but in what really amounts to U.S. exceptionalism, that uh, our rights in, enshrined in the Constitution are better than the treaties, and that's why we don't sign them. I mean, give me a break. And the other thing was to say that there's this uh, process that has to go through, it's complicated through the U.S. Senate. If they wanted to pass uh, uh, these, uh, to ascend to these treaties, they could. Uh, and, and again, this is one of those half-truths. While they have signed certain, they have also applied uh, reservations, understandings, and declarations, which basically nullify them and to say they're non self executing. Uh, but that's okay. Just because you say they're non self executing doesn't mean that people can't use the content and the language to help us. In fact, here in Georgia, where we have two uh, Senate races coming up, uh, we have to think about our right to participate in the political process. Uh, the, the use of, of the uh, U.S. Postal Service to delay the delivery of ballots, to hold on to ballots in Miami-Dade County that people knew were there. And, and then to, we, we had to go to court in order to make sure that there were regular sweeps to make sure that they were not holding ballots in, in a sophisticated way to delay. The other thing is uh, the voter suppression activities that were undertaken not just in Georgia, but across the country. And in fact, everywhere that President Trump is talking about um, uh, uh, recounts or, or, or that they were yeah. illegally cast ballots, those are African-American areas like Philadelphia, Milwaukee, or, or here in Atlanta metropolitan area, or, in, or uh, uh, Latinx and indigenous areas such as out in uh, Muscogee County, I think I pronounced it right, in Arizona uh, or in Clark County in the, where Las Vegas is. So I think that uh, I wish there had been more discussion, but maybe what we can do, uh, the human rights movement broadly, is to provide some of the people who express some genuine concern about what's happening with the U.S. human rights record an update since they didn't have it. I'm assuming that's the reason they didn't say anything. Yeah, no, I mean, you brought up so many good points because with the treaty bodies, right? It's the same argument that's dusted off every four years. It's nothing we haven't heard before that in the US, we only ratify when we really are achieving them. And it's like, you can't say that on CERD. Like, what are you talking about? And then the other side, they try to promote, we've ratified five out of nine. Well, no, we all know they've only ratified three, civil and political, racial discrimination and torture. And the others are optional protocols. If you want to add optional protocols, we never recognize the optional protocol allowing individuals to petition those treaty bodies. So they're just playing with things and trying to make things. And we know that they're not even, I think we could all speak to this, the consultation this time was so much weaker and just not even an attempt, a genuine attempt. And also the report, the report, I think that's an area we could all look at that they turn in a report in August that doesn't even mention COVID. So they turn it in late. And then they don't even mention the COVID crisis at all with yeah. so many deaths. There's, there's, it, they just didn't even come to the game of this UPR, the Super Bowl of Human Rights, ready to actually talk. And probably, I think, Carrie, I think there's other things we could look at. But when they said at the beginning and the end, we've enjoyed partnering with civil society and working with, you know, I was looking at <laughs> who'd we partner with? Did I miss the meeting? Yeah. The only time they had a consultation they let us know with less than a week. And it's like, try to get to DC and then the phones never work. So it's the same game. 
that every time a UPR or a treaty by review comes up, like phones ain't gonna work again, or what are we gonna do now? So we can think about how we move forward with these next steps and what we want to really push. So what are some of the human rights priorities then that we think we could get in Chicago, in Georgia, and at the national level, where we could then say in four years at the next UPR, this has changed. What are some of maybe the, the low hanging fruit that we could pick? And like, what are some of the longer term things, but what's the next steps we need to do together as a movement? Well, as I mentioned, uh, we need to push for Biden to uh, hold the ICCPR, the CERD, and the CAT reviews. He needs to hold those. Uh, and as we were speaking about, um, Obama did them within months of each other. So we can catch up. And if we're talking about those things, we can address a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do here on the ground. Well, we're trying to get civilian police of accountability councils, which allow us more, uh, which will allow for independent investigations of police crimes, right? Uh, instead of them investigating themselves is independent. And since at least this DOJ um, administration and even the DOJ administration from before, because Mike Brown was murdered. And the fact that even under Obama, the DOJ couldn't figure that out uh, leaves me pause when it comes to Kamala and, um, and Joe Biden. Um, uh, getting involved with women's rights, right? Um, you could pass the CDAW, you know, we could um, assign and ratify CDAW so that we could cover women's rights, not only in the police violence sector, but across our country. Um, and uh, I think the last thing is, is to really get these, um, uh, some of these consent decrees back out into some of these areas. So if he wants to come in and come in hard to take some, um, to take some control. And then, I'm sorry, the last thing would be getting the Emmett Till anti-lynching uh, even and taking slavery. Now that's a hard one, okay? Because we're asking to amend the constitution. So we would have to amend the 13th amendment to take out the clause that allows them to enslave incarcerated people. And mainly because if I'm incarcerated and you're paying me 35 cents or however much they pay incarcerated people to stamp out license plates to you know farm to breed dogs and all the rest of the stuff, they should be making you know thirty dollars an hour to do some of this stuff. And if I'm incarcerated, but it isn't a burden on my family for me to be incarcerated because you have to pay me at least minimum wage for the work I do and I can send that money back to my family and I can start becoming that caretaker that I need, that would be a positive step, especially for you know, uh, our, our people as in uh, black and brown people, right? So those are, those are the big, I think five, uh, that I think need to be done when it comes to next steps with Biden. Thank you, so we have five minutes to go still, Carrie and Keith. Sure. Um, okay, I'll try to be quick. So just one more thing about the Commission of Unalienable Rights for viewers. It's very bad. And in fact, there's a, a federal lawsuit against it and uh, over 100 human rights organizations have spoken out about it. And I'd encourage people to do some, some research to find out more, but it's, it's definitely not a good thing. Um, so I want to just say a little bit about what's going to happen post UPR. Uh, the United States, they have a couple of months um, during which they can respond to all of the recommendations and they can think about, you know, which ones they support or note or which are pending or they reject. And um, during that period, what civil society can do is we can lobby the government to accept recommendations. And since we have a new administration going in, anything's possible. So we should definitely do that. And one thing that we're talking about within the network is, is possibly working on um, developing a draft implementation plan. And another thing that civil society can do around March or April when the Human Rights Council holds a session, uh, you have the opportunity to actually intervene with an oral statement. 
regarding the UPR report and acceptance of the report that comes out of the Human Rights Council. So everyone can think about that and please keep visiting our upr2020.org website for information and to uh, see how you can possibly get involved. Thank you so much. And that brings us to Georgia. Georgia is definitely on our mind. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the new South, but the now South. Keith, what's going to happen between now and January 5th and how well, we need to mobilize? You can already see the national strategy of the Republican Party be, uh, unfolding. Uh, the two uh, uh, Republican senators, uh, Kelly Loeffler, uh, who either uh, owns or co-owns the, the uh, 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 Stock Exchange, and, and David Perdue, whose, brother, whose uh, cousin is the Secretary of Agriculture, but, uh, sent out a note saying that um, uh, the Secretary of State should step down. This is an attempt to put a blanket or a cloud over the entire electoral process in Georgia. And that's consistent with President Trump and, quite frankly, the 70 million people who voted for him. And that's what we have to look at. Uh, Trumpism will not be disappearing, even if he does. And Trumpism fights against the things that we are fighting for. And I think we have to translate certain things like the right to the adequate standard of living uh, to um, minimum wage, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I, I think at the end of the day, uh, we should come up with a list of things. Uh, Biden has already said that they will rejoin the Paris Accord. That's great. Uh, but what does that mean for us at, at the national, state, or local levels? And I think the road ahead is complex and contradictory. We have to fight for ratification, even though we know that uh, maternal health is off the chain, the problems of maternal health is off the chain. And then at the, uh, you know, women are still being shackled in prisons to have, have babies as well. And so I think that the outrage that we feel when we understand what human rights violations are in this country, we have to find ways of translating that so that people can understand. And I, I for one, can say very clearly, I'm really not interested in, in uh, embracing my abusers. And that's what the Trumpism and the 70 million mean. We can't uh, ignore that. And, and in my tradition, we say that uh, every goodbye ain't gone. So I don't think that Donald Trump is just going to disappear. No, so no. I agree. And it is great to say the former administration, as we're doing events now, and we can all do the dancing that we saw around the country, but we definitely know this dance for democracy will take a lot more. And I want to thank all of you for taking time and being here today to discuss and look at the world casting its ballot on human rights in the United States. And we look forward to continuing this conversation every two weeks to see how we can then change the situation we have on the ground. Mahalo, thank you so much, everyone.